Welcome to Rogue Trader. Please read the disclaimer and remember that prices can go down as well as up. Hello and welcome to another Rogue Trader video. And today I'm looking at Diversified Energy. Diversified Energy are a FTSE 250 listed company. However, they're headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama, and all of their resources are based in the US. The majority of their assets are based in the Appalachian Basin region in the US. These, this is a large agglomeration of natural, of natural gas assets, which they've been building up over the last 20 years. As you can see, since 2001, they've been raising debt and doing share issuances in order to build up now what is quite a large portfolio. And their argument is, is that by a consolidation and at a larger scale, they're, they're able to create a good return to shareholders. They actually pay a massive 12% in dividends. Also, in the coming years, they're planning to move into the central region here in Texas and Louisiana to replicate what they've achieved in the Appalachian Basin. And so that's their forward growth strategy. This is from their latest annual report, and it highlights how what they tend to do is buy these assets off the explorer companies who are less interested in them once they've got past their peak production. But diversified energy pride themselves in getting greater efficiency out of assets that are in this stage of their life cycle. They pay out massive dividends of 12%. They hedge the gas price. So in a lot of ways, Diversified Energy reminded me of Greencoat UK Wind. This was a company I looked at quite some time ago. But they're the same in that whereas Greencoat UK Wind basically just took on lots of debt and did lots of share issuances to buy up wind farms and then pay back a high dividend from that. Diversified Energy is similar in that they just take on debt and do uh, cash raises by selling shares to buy up lots of gas assets to then pay back a large dividend and in their case they're saying that they're getting a lot more productivity out of these assets at this huge scale than was the case when they were before they were originally purchased so you really need to look at them more as a investment fund where you're just investing in uh, into gas and getting back a high 12% a high 12% dividend as a return on your investment without being so interested in share price they are very highly leveraged at 2 to 1 but they could still be a a play on the greta gold strategy because although their profits are hedged You've then got to think about their overall the, the worth the value of their assets so if because of a if because of a energy crisis the price of gas stays high in the long term then this would be a good up, uplift to this company's assets but in a fairly muted way because of the hedging so when i look at the share price over the last five years it's actually fairly restrained and in fact flat practically flat apart from the uh, the covid crash in early 2020 it is re it's remained rather rather flat so you're getting a good 10 percent dividend every year um at you know with with according to this uh, relatively low risk to their share price similar to green coat wind energy most of their news reports are just them buying up new assets you can always press print screen. There's no point in me reading out all of these, but they have over the last five years been buying up more and more assets. It's also notable that they listed on AIM back in 2017, and then they listed on the FTSE 250 in September 2020. And each of these listers obviously come with fundraisers and something important is that in 2020 they reached a 1 billion deal with oak tree capital management investment company and um that's you know that's kind of a, a good deal to help them buy um, this is going to help them with their strategy to buy 
into the central region and then in 2021 there was the um, Thanos and Blackbeard acquisitions which play into their central region strategy so when I look at their profit and loss and we see that they are producing increased revenues in fact in the interim 75% increased revenues on 2020 and that's because the price of gas has increased markedly it was actually at record lows in 2020 but then it started increasing towards the end of 2020 to three dollars and now in 2021 we see it absolutely skyrocketing their operating expense amortization depreciation of assets and their general and administrative expense these are um, fairly these are looking fairly similar as we go year to year despite the increase in assets purchased in 2020 so that's kind of good because what we're wanting to see is this company increasing their revenues by their new acquisitions without necessarily increasing their expenditure what's quite notable though is the effect on their derivative instrument so because they hedge their gas assets they do this so that regardless of if the price of gas goes up or down they still get the same dependable income coming in but with the gas price increasing so much in 2020 and then 2021 this has then led to a loss overall because of the uh, because of these derivatives and we see in 2020 we had a 94 million loss but then as the prices continue to increase in 2021 they've got a whopping 395 million loss of um, because of the uh, derivatives and that's only and with the gas price increasing um, then you know we could be looking at something like a 1 billion loss in 2021 from these derivatives an impact for the, from these derivatives now here's a presentation that they had uh, which they did an investment call on which I advise you go onto YouTube and listen to yourself but in this they explain or their CFO ex explained that the derivative these derivatives costs effectively don't matter and we can see that way they had a um a operating profit of actually um their operating profit is a really nasty negative 78 million in 2020 and then negative 306 million in their 2021 interims so this normally to me would be an absolute basket case situation that I would no way invest in however when I went on their investment call they explained that because of the way they do their accounts for this company and the way that they do their hedging for this company the actual operating profit and net income doesn't actually really matter because of the way they're set up um, so that with the hedging it's more a case of worrying about what's the long-term increase in assets and uh, cash flow so this slides from their investor call and it shows how they because of their hedging that they do in some years you might get massive cash gains as had happened in 2020 but then you also get losses if the price of gas go up but the point is is that because they do this hedging although you get massive income or loss year to year which kind of looks which kind of makes their profit and loss look all over the place the point is is that they guarantee a steady fixed cash flow coming in and then they use that cash flow to pay the massive dividends and to pay off their debt and also to fund new asset growth and what you've got to realize uh, again looking at this slide from their investor call is that the next couple of years they're highly hedged so for 2022 next year three quarters of their gas revenues are hedged the price is hedged so they're going to take on a massive loss for that you've got to realize that then going forward 
only 30% of their get the gas prices hedged. So this massive negative number, that includes um, all of their gas revenues going forward. You know, that includes 30% of those gas revenues going forward 10 years. That's reflected in that loss for just this year. But the important point is, is that there's this um, three dollars income guaranteed for all that for all that future. So that going down the line in the future, they guarantee a certain cash flow, which they need to in order to ensure they can keep paying this high dividend and pay off their debts in a manageable way. And then longer term down the line. If the gas price was to increase, was to stay increased for a longer period of time, because only 30% of the future gas price is hedged, then they can fix in this higher gas price as they move through the years. So that would actually mean that the, uh, the, the, they would get a big increase in the value of their assets in the long term. But there's still quite a lot of protection there. You know, it's kind of quite uh, cautious. Um, if there's a massive increase in gas, the price of gas, because of an energy crisis, you know, they are going to benefit from that. But it's cautious. It's, you know, hedged. So I advise you to take a listen to the investor update where they go into this in detail about their uh, derivative costs and how it means that actually the operating profit doesn't really matter so much for this company. You've got to think more of this company as, you know, not that much will happen to the share price, but they pay back a 10% dividend every year based on the increase in their assets over time. But the fact is, at the end of the day, you need to make that leap of faith. On top of my explanation, here's, um, here's some edited fragments of the uh, the CFO's explanation in their investment call but I suggest you go and listen to the whole thing before you make before you take this leap of faith yourself what I will say is that you know there's there's one thing that stands out in the results and that's obviously the hedge uh, non-cash marked market or what you see on the third line there that the gain on unsettled gain or loss on unsettled derivative instruments uh, 371 million dollars during the period Without context, that can be a rather jarring, uh, but when you really unpack it, uh, you begin to see it's, it's not only um, not a true liability to the company from the standpoint of long-term value creation, uh, it really creates opportunity for us. And so we wanna make sure that we provide proper context to that and hopefully distill. Uh, the reason that there's volatility through the uh, IFRS income statement is, is because we elect to account for, our, we do not designate our derivative time contracts as hedges for accounting purposes. Uh, so the changes in fair value go through current period earnings, even though this is a very long dated hedge portfolio. So you know, the theme that you find in our financial statements, you know, absent the, the hedge uh, marked markets is a, is a constant stability. You know, we, we really want to focus on stable production, driving stable cash flow, because from the beginning, we've been about returns to stakeholders, and that's dividends for our equity investor and it's debt payments for our debt investor. Uh, and in order to do that, we want to take as much commodity price risk off of the table as we can, but ultimately delivered a very consistent price across all periods, which allowed us to, to deliver a very consistent dividend payment along the way. If we move to 13, you know, we talked about, yeah, $371 million that went through the income statement in just the first six months alone. And that added to some uh, mark to market liability that you saw emerge on the balance sheet at year end. For a total hedge liability, unsettled mark to market uh, liability of about $537 million, which, which, is, which can be a bit daunting. But it's important to remember that that is a 10 year payment stream. So you can see what we tried to show here is that we have a very long dated hedge portfolio that underpins the, the low cost financing that we have as well as the very long lived assets that we have. And so if you look across that horizon, you, the, you see the foundation of the graph is our cost structure. 
And then the green line through the graph is our hedged price. So that shaded region represents a positive cash flow margin that spans for the full decade. And it's that margin, that, that, that positive free cash flow uh, that pays our dividend, pays our debt, and then allows us to reinvest into the business uh, in not only a sustaining way, but in a growth oriented way as well. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And it was because of that, that strong hedge protection that we were able to not only sustain our dividend during uh, the COVID um, shutdowns, we were actually able to increase our dividend twice um, with confidence that our cash flows would be there because our, our, our production would be there for newly acquired assets. So in 2020 alone, you'll recall, we made $118 million in dividend and, and share repurchase distributions for the benefit of shareholders, while also paying back $82 million of debt. And we were able to do that because of the hedge protection. But if you move forward, the natural gas price curve has gone up, and that's it. Still stay on thirteen for a while. Absolutely. So you'll see that that dotted red line is now going above our hedged green line, and so that that rise in natural gas prices creates a payment liability on future production if, in fact, those prices ultimately are realized. And you can see the quantum of that with the stacked bars across that time horizon. But what's important is that any unhedged volumes that we have in those same periods will realize that higher price. And so unhedged volumes actually benefit from higher prices, which is a net positive to the company. So we'd much rather be in this environment than we would where our, where our hedges are worth significantly more and we're losing uh, value on the unhedged portion. To help me make more sense of their profit and loss, I did this visualization where we have the, the revenue they've achieved as they've stacked on increased assets. And we see how that did dip in 2020, which I relate to the reduction in the price of gas in 2020. Then we take away the, then we take away their operating expenses and their depletion of their assets and the amortization and then we take away their, their general and admin expense. And so after taking off all those usual costs, this gives us a good idea here of really how profitable they were before the hedging and tax and stuff. And it didn't actually look so good for 2020. And I, 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 take, I think that's because of the, and I think that's because of the lower price in 2020. However, we know that from the interims, the revenue shoots up. So on the interim, as we expect their their naked profits to, to shoot up. Then we have the effect of the hedging. And we know that they do this hedging so that they have a good baseline income every year um, in order to pay their in order to pay their dividend sustainably and grow their base assets sustainably. But we see that the uh, after the hedging in 2020, we're, uh, we're at a loss here. And it only got pulled back in 2020 uh, because of tax adjustments. So we see in the profit and loss that they actually, uh, in 2020 and in 2021, got a, um, a tax benefit. And when I looked into the annual report about this, it turns out that because they have um, low producing wells, uh, when the gas price is low, they get a special tax benefit. So it's, it looks like the government actually pays out free money to companies who own wells, which wouldn't perhaps normally be profitable. You know, these other companies have been relinquishing them and selling them off after they've well, long after their their peak. Diversified Energy have then bought these wells, but the government promises to um, to pay for them through tax through tax credits, even if they're no longer profitable. And that's a bit of a revelation there that at low gas prices, a lot of their stock is no no longer profitable without government handouts but nevertheless they do still get that and then that plays into their price so when i look at their assets and debt 
their assets are dominated by the actual gas fields that they operate and then the property plant and equipment that comes with that and we see a steady increase in assets as they've gone out gone around buying up um, buying up projects all over the place over the last five years their liabilities are dominated by the debt that they take on to buy those assets and also asset retirement obligations because once you buy it when they buy these older fields once they eventually run out which seems to happen after a few decades then you actually have to close down and retire those assets so that's now becoming a significant part of their liabilities and that's something to obviously keep note on with this company as time goes on and then their derivatives now are becoming a noticeable part of their liabilities so overall like they're quite open about they're highly leveraged and their debt is maintains at around 50 percent of their of their overall net assets um you know and we this is the trend continues as it's been and it's well worth uh, keeping an eye on Generally, I don't like companies with lots of debt. And, you know, you, there's a certain element of trust and well, there's a certain uncomfort level with this company in terms of their debt. But you can certainly say that they've cert at least um, maintained the same trend over time. They, when I look at this visualization of their equity and their valuation, we see that their net assets are around peg with their market capitalization so they do look fairly reasonable value their price to book is only one to one and their price their price to sales is roughly uh, two to one or three to one according to reuters so they look kind of good they look good from this from this visualization when i look at their statement of cash flows we see that 248 million of cash is coming in from their normal operations and they got on 758 million of new debt and raised 81 million from share issue. In terms of the cash outflows, well, they, there is roughly a quarter of a billion in buying new assets. And um, they, had to, they had to spend 705 million paying off debt with 99 million going out as dividends and 16 million in share buybacks. Now, I have to say that I understand the cash flows from investing and cash flow from financing fairly well. So these elements of the cash flow I'm fairly comfortable with. When it comes to the cash flow from operations, the, the accounting behind this is fairly complex. And I really do not understand how, for example, these tax credits or a negative cash flow and how these deriv derivative losses of a quarter of a billion are a positive cash flow. So this element of the cash flow is beyond my understanding quite a bit. What I can say about it is that the derivatives are a, a very sizable proportion of their cash flow from operations. And also the cash, the tax credits are quite a large aspect of their cash flow. It's notable that they actually lost 23 million from, from selling gas. So it's interesting that when you consider that this company's whole main gig is selling gas, of their entire cash flow of operations of a quarter of a billion, actually selling gas seems to have been only a 23 million loss overall so you know this is kind of complicated stuff going on and i can't say that i understand this portion of their cash flow it's also quite important to highlight that they raised three quarters of a billion in new debt to pay off 0.7 million in debt so typically with a normal vanilla company I'd be looking at this kind of thing would be not very appealing to me 
and you have to accept that with this company there's some kind of fairly complicated things going on um, to explain how they work and to justify how they pay a 10% dividend every year um, and why you'd be investing on them in terms of increased assets and guaranteed dividend return and all the stuff going on with the hedging you know this is a very this is a very complicated company and i personally can't say that i really understand what's going on i'm i'm having to um i'm having to uh, take a bit of a leap of faith when i invest in this company which isn't really a good thing to be doing when i look at their shareholders it's notable that their directors are actually um, snapping up some shares and uh, that's always a commendable thing so they had some large shareholders like hb like hsbc bank who've actually been selling all their holdings and um, at the same time these other people have been buying up holdings in this company so that kind of there was a changing of the guard in 2021 and since then generally it's only been people buying more notably black rock and actually if you look at the most recent rns releases for diversified energy the most um quite recently black rock have been buying up shares and actually i can't help but wonder if the you know the recent positive trend in their share price and the way it looks kind of linear is that is that some of these p these large institutionals buying up shares their shareholder composition is fairly nice and evenly spread compared with other stocks i've looked at recently and um generally it seems to be a positive trend of the major holders buying shares now if you look at my greta gold series i did I went into how perhaps we could be coming into a energy crisis in the next few years. And I think that because of the hedging, diversified energy would only be a partial claim on this. But, but they certainly would have some upside when you consider the worth of their asset, their net assets. In the longer term, they would get a serious uplift if there was a permanent increase in gas prices. So it's definitely worth having an update on the energy crisis situation. And funnily enough, uh, only, in the, only as recently as the 21st of September, the International Energy Agency came out with a statement where they went to great pains to say that recent increases in global natural gas prices and not because of the new clean energy transition so i find that incredible because if the iea are saying this if the iea is saying that the recent crisis in gas prices isn't because of the clean energy transition that means you know pretty damn well that all of this chaos is because of the clean energy transition so one really interesting story last week was when the UK announced this bailout for these fertilizer factories. So what happened was there was this urgent story that just came out of nowhere that the supermarket shelves were going to be empty of fizzy pop and pork and chicken. And the reason being that there was about to be, there was an imminent CO2 shortage in the UK. And it turned out that CO2 is made as a byproduct of fertilizer production. And there was only a few fertilizer factories in the UK. And because of the high gas price, they had shut down because of the high gas price. The CO2 and then therefore supplies of meat into the supermarkets was going to run out in a matter of days. And so the UK government has stepped in to basically pay for them to make the fertilizer at a loss um, with, the, you know, with the UK, with the government contributing to avoid a massive crisis. Now, okay, this was in the UK, not in the US, but 
it was just an interesting little signal of energy crisis going on in the world. I looked into the uh, the EIA website, which is more focused on the US, and apparently 38% of the gas consumption is in electrical power. I found this useful website, Noma, which has lots of data around natural gas. And we could see how in the long run, the natural gas prices have been dropping to a real low. And this was the time period where diversified energy were buying all these assets off these other companies. But then if you go back in time, you can see how historically higher gas prices have been more normal. And you can see how then we've been how we've been spiking up as we get this uh, get this energy crisis um, of the last year, which you'll see from a lot of my other videos um, has been as there's a switch towards clean energy. Um, the gas and oil energy um, has been completely neglected, and then it's leading to a supply a bit of a supply demand crunch at the moment. It's interesting to look at all this stuff that natural gas is used for. So it's not just used for energy, you know, it's used for manufacturing. It's used for in public services. It's used for, it's used for in the chemical and petrochemical industries. It's used in the food and tobacco industry. And there's some interesting graphs here where we see how since the Corona crunch, you know, in the last year, as the economy has been expanding and GDP has been expanding, we see more shipments of chemical products in the US and we see more iron and steel production in the US. So this supports and this helps explain why the price in natural gas has been going up. Diversified energy, they hedge their prices. So this is kind of an irrelevance now because of their hedge prices. But in the longer term, if we get like five to 10 years of um, increased gas prices, you know, that would be quite an uplift for diversified energy. Because when you, you know, you look at their hedge and you look in these later years in their, their hedging curve here, that would actually be a big uplift in their assets, their net assets above where their market cap now stands. So what's my verdict for diversified energy? Well, I've decided I'll add them to my watch list. Really, they're best considered a natural gas investment fund where you're getting a 10% return every year from dividends with their share price increases should be just limited because of the way they hedge their future revenues. The, looking at the Greta Gold thesis, though, there are limited gains to be had from these in the long run based on their assets valuation. If there's a long-term permanent increase in gas prices because of the um, because of what we've done to uh, gas supply over the last five years, this definitely would see increase in their share price um, as, as their assets increased relative to their market capitalization. However, one problem with this stock is their net income dynamics mean that you've got to take a real leap of faith before investing in them. You know, you've really got to believe future hedged free cash flow is all that matters above current positive or negative net income. It means you've got to take a real accounting leap of faith with this one before you invest. So I've put them on my watch list for consideration. And the long term risks are this leap of faith where there's all this stuff around the hedging, which is hard to properly understand unless you've got a PhD in accounting. That in itself is a risk if you go into this stock. This business of replicating what they've done in the Appalachian Basin in the central region there is, of course, certain certain element of risk to if they to if they manage to play that out properly or not. That's something that you'd want to want to monitor in terms of their risks. I picked out that important to their 
income every year is the tax adjustments. So if we find themselves at low gas prices again, the, if the government took away these, um, these, t these tax credits, that would be a risk as well. Overall, they, they kind of look like a simple low risk, 10% return on your dividends. If you treat them as like a investment fund into gas energy, then when you dig into them, they're extremely complicated what's going on and a bit of a leap of faith required because they're very difficult to understand um, with, with all of the stuff going on there. So I hope you've enjoyed my analysis of diversified energy and good luck with your own investments.